Hey everyone, it's Colin, how's it going? I'm starting up a project just to get a new stereo system in the garage for music, but instead of buying all name brand components, I hopped on eBay. So this time, let's see what kind of audio amp you can get for 45 bucks. All right, so I'm working on setting up just some music in the garage. I've got kind of a cheap boombox shelf system thing in there now, and it's kind of on its last legs. So I wanted to do something a little bit better, and this is actually gonna be part one of a very short series. There's another part that's gonna be coming up at some point in the future where I talk a little bit more about what I'm hooking up. But as part of a, the prerequisite for it, obviously I need an amp, right? For any sort of stereo system, you need an amplifier, and obviously you need speakers and other stuff too but I didn't really have a suitable amp. And I could have gone out and bought like a stereo receiver, like a proper thing, but those are gonna cost a bit more money. And the other thing is those are typically pretty big. I don't need like a home theater size receiver out in my garage. It's a small garage. I want to take up as little space as possible. And this is just for background music for when I'm like working on the car or projects or whatever. So I went out and I decided to look up what eBay has to offer. There's actually quite a bit out there. This is what I settled on. It showed up pretty recently. Let's take a look at what's inside the box and just kind of an overview of the actual product itself. See if it's worth the 45 bucks that I spent on it. To start, we've got power brick. Um, a lot of these smaller little amps are gonna have an external power adapter. Um, as far as I can tell. And this one seems to be reasonably decent-ish quality, I suppose. I'm not asking for a ton. One thing that's a bummer is the power cable is permanently attached. Um, I was hoping on the AC input side that it would be like one of those kind of figure eight type of cables like you see with laptop power bricks. Um, this one, the wires on both ends are permanently attached. This one is 12 volt, five amp, um, and that'll, matter we'll talk about that in a little bit but i think this is going to be a reasonably decent power supply at least to get me started uh, the upside is it is a standard barrel connector on the end so if i need to swap it out for something else well i can do that down the road what else do we have let's take a look at the amp itself real quick i guess um so it's this Kind of nice, honestly, this is kind of nice looking. Um, red aluminum anodized chassis. I have a feeling this is kind of just a, a stock enclosure. Like you could buy this enclosure to put any other random electronic project you want in. I don't think it's manufactured specifically for this particular product. There are just a ton of little amps like this all over eBay with various capabilities and power ratings and all that. You've got a regular three and a half millimeter analog audio inputs so if you want to plug in a headphone cable kind of thing uh, to play off of a music player or whatever, you can totally do that. But this thing also has Bluetooth built in. Um, apparently it doesn't require a password, should hopefully have somewhat decent range. Uh, the idea is I just want to go out in the garage and turn this thing on and, you know, like fire up Spotify on my phone or whatever, and then just forget it, you know, and let this thing just go for a while while I'm tinkering around with whatever. So Bluetooth makes a lot of sense to have built in. Um, DC jack input, thankfully it's center positive. They aren't doing anything weird with uh, center negative. I hate those. Those drive me nuts. Anyway, and then output jacks. These are banana plugs. Um, but looking at them now, one... They're, <laughs> they're crooked. You see, you see they're not perfectly spaced. So I'm, did someone like hand drill the holes that these go in or something? I don't know. Um, these are awful close together. I don't think the banana plugs that I have, I've got some spares. I think they're actually too big to fit side by side with the spacing on these connectors. I, I kind of wish they had just gone with regular spring terminals on the back here instead of the banana, uh, bananas, but whatever. Anyway, what else we got? We got the power brick. Um, the box comes with some other stuff. They gave you a nice three and a half mil audio lead. Okay. Probably not going to need it. I've got a drawer full of them, but thought that counts. They've got 
Oh, mini jack to RCA cable. And then one last thing in the box here. Let's take a look. I think it's the spec sheet, which is probably useful information. Super mini size. But they put, it's, it's upside down. They put the picture of the amp upside down on the spec sheet. Were they, okay. But like, it's got the feet. They intentionally, why? They intentionally put the picture upside down because it's showing the feet. It's not like they took a right side up picture and rotated it. Output power is 50 watts per channel. So it's supposedly 100 watts total, 50 watts per channel. I don't think it'll do that. And terminating impedance is four to eight ohm. That's pretty normal. I'm not surprised by that. Although I suspect this thing will definitely not be able to do 50 watts at four ohms. Even then, even if this is only 20 watts per channel, it's not like I'm gonna be driving a gigantic stereo in my garage or anything. So this is actually plenty. Um, input mode analog, well, except for the Bluetooth, and then power input. See, here's where things get interesting. So they're talking about it can take anywhere between 12 and 24 volts. The power output you get out of an amp like this, because this is a little class D type of amp. It's literally just an amp on a chip instead of being a more traditional like class, you know, AB type of design. Um, a lot of what this amp is going to be able to do is going to be dependent on what power you feed it. So this power brick, I mean, yeah, it's 12, 12 volt, five amps, but this amp would probably do a lot better if I went out and found like an old laptop power supply, you know, something that's like 19 or 20 volts that can crank out that same, you know, five or six amps, just basically give it more juice and a higher voltage. This amp is gonna be a lot more capable. So maybe that's something I need to keep in mind for the future when I start getting this all put together. If this thing seems like it's a bit underpowered and if you decide to go out and buy a little amp like this and it seems like it's just not cutting it, Try taking a look at the power brick and see if maybe it's undersized for what you need. All right, so that's what's in the box. Not a whole lot more. I guess we can put some of this crap back. I don't bend to go away. All the cables. Uh, I suppose, you know what? Let's at least see if this thing turns on, right? Uh, probably a, a wise idea before I go and start uh, planning my, my stereo system around this thing. If it's a piece of junk and doesn't even want to work, well then we got to go back to the drawing board. So there's no power switch on this unit, but okay. So it's one of those clicky on off kind of volume knobs, which is really nice. So you just click it to turn it on and then volume up down. Um, I like that. I was afraid that this would be one of those, like it's just on all the time types of deals because I don't I don't need it on all the time right that's just a waste of power so plug this guy in and uh okay well it's not starting on fire or anything that's a good sign the power LED is on but the switch is the switch is off is this maybe it's just to indicate that it's getting power or something um I mean, so the thing's got Bluetooth. Where's my phone? It's showing that it's ready to pair. But the switch is off. Is it? Oh, don't tell me. Don't hang, don't, don't freaking tell me. Where are they? Where, where are my screwdrivers? That's, that's it. Oh, it's on. All right, well, I guess you're getting more than just an unboxing out of this one. What kind of screws? I had a feeling that we would need to do something like this. It's never this easy, right? All right, lift the lid here. And uh, yeah, it's about what I expected. Uh, the board slides. Okay. Yep. So the board slides into the bottom part of the aluminum thing. Let's 
get that out of the way. These are just soldered on there. Not too awesome of soldering, but not too horrible either. So likely we've got some power filtering. Uh, this is more likely than not going to be the actual amp chip itself under the heat sink. We'll pull that. So they've got a few things going on with this Bluetooth module. You can see there's an antenna lead that goes to that external port where the little rubber ducky plugged into. Um, that's just going down here and soldering to the board. This board is an all-in-one kind of module, it looks like. So it's got these little cutouts on the side of the PCB to interface with solder pads on the main PCB here. It's got a built-in antenna back there, but obviously inside an aluminum you know, enclosure, that's gonna hurt your RF performance. So I guess it was good to see that they bothered to put this external antenna on there, but that also suggests that this could be like a totally just modular product, right? I'm sure this board was designed with maybe two audio inputs that would just get mixed together evenly. One is that three and a half mil jack on the back and then the other one is the input from this Bluetooth module. And there were plenty of other amps similar to this on eBay that didn't offer Bluetooth. So there's probably another version where they just skip putting maybe the antenna lead and the Bluetooth module on it and sell it as just like an analog, you know, three and a half mil input only kind of product. I want to see what's underneath this heatsink, see if we can get a closer look at the uh, the amp chip getting used. Oh, these screws are not tight at all. This heatsink is flapping. I just took one screw out. Look at this. This thing is just rattling around on there. I bet there's not much in terms of thermal paste or anything on the other side. Here, we'll uh, we'll explore it together. Ready? One, two, three. Nope. <laughs> Look at that. There's the bottom of the, the heat sink. I mean, I guess it's good they didn't bother to put a heat sink on here, but yeah, there's like not Like, look, there's practically nothing on that chip. Let's get in a little bit closer if we can. All right, so here's a look at that chip. If you look carefully there, it says TDA3116. I did a quick little bit of Googling on that, and that kind of makes reference to just this board as a whole. However, there is a Texas Instruments part called TPA3116. The spec sheet for that chip does actually say it'll do 50 watts per channel into a four ohm load if you feed it 21 volts. And this is where, like I was talking about earlier, where the actual power supply is going to matter. If you only have like a 15 volt amp uh, power supply, the spec sheet says this thing will only do 15 watts per channel at eight ohms. And then if you can step that up to a 24 volt power supply, it'll double the power. It'll do... 30 watts per channel at eight ohms. Now, the other big question remains though, is this chip legit? Now I can't tell because it looks like they either etched away or scratched off or something that center of the chip, maybe so it could interface with the heat sink a bit better, but in the process it obliterated all of the engraving on the top of the chip package. So while this thing visually looks similar to that Texas Instruments like spec sheet. I just can't say for sure whether this is the genuine part or if it's some sort of clone or knockoff chip, in which case the specifications could be way, way different than what Texas Instruments notes in the spec sheet. I want to figure out what the deal is with this switch. So if you look at the switch, and volume potentiometer. This is gonna be what they call a dual gang potentiometer because it's controlling two channels at the same time, in this case, left and right. Obviously you want you know the volume to go up and down on both channels you know, at the same time and the same amount, but it's a switched potentiometer and typically you'll see on this kind of layout, 
all of the volume, like the actual potentiometer part of it is gonna be close together. So that's what these six are gonna be for, that row of three and that row of three. But then if it does switching, as in an on off, like with that clicky knob part of it, those are gonna be separate contacts towards the back. What I want to figure out is like, are those hooked up to anything? And if so, what? Part of what I want to look at is the actual just layout of this board. Thankfully, because it's two sided, it's pretty straightforward. Obviously, we've got a really nice clear view of the back. Not a whole lot going on back here. Just a few random passives. This side, there's going to be some components covering traces and all that. So it may not be quite so easy if we have to figure stuff out on this side. But I figure, you know what, let's just start by looking at where the power comes in. Because traditionally, when you switch stuff, you're going to switch it on the positive leg and you're going to switch it as close to the source as possible. So looking at the back, here's the DC input jack. So that corresponds to these pins. I think this third one right here, I should have a spudger for pointing to all this. This third one right here, I think is just for physical support for the jack. It doesn't connect to anything, but you've got this side and this side. Now, looking at the layout of the solder mask and the traces on this board, I don't think it's much of a stretch to presume that the big, like kind of yellow orange section in here on this side of the board is gonna be the ground plane. So by tracing out where everything goes, it means that this lower trace coming from the DC input jack is likely going to be ground. And so that means this other trace is probably going to be positive. And that especially kind of, you know, is confirmed by the fact that it doesn't intersect with any of these other ground traces. This is kind of a weird layout with the way they had to do it up and down and around and stuff. But who knows, maybe their board layout software just did it this way. I don't I don't know. But We've got a component here. Looks like this big cap. I'm guessing that's for filtering um, across the two sides. And then it proceeds on and branches off into two places. The positive side then goes to this via, which that via is going into here, if you can see it. And then it looks like that's what powers the chip. So that's how the chip can accept pretty much any voltage input that you feed it. Um, the power from the DC input jack literally just goes straight through that via to the other side of the board and into the chip. And then the other leg branches off, goes over here and into this set of three solder joints, which if we flip the board over is going to be this guy. So this is likely our voltage regulator to kind of standardize everything down to, I don't know what voltage they're using on this, probably, I'm gonna guess either 12 or five volts. So where does the switch come into play? Like we've got the, the, the legs for it here and they've got solder on them. So they soldered it down, but what do they connect to? I've got the multimeter going here and we've got it just set to continuity. This board doesn't have any power, so there's no risk of shorting anything out. I figure, you know what, let's just try and go through and figure out what's hooked up to what. So to confirm that this is the negative like ground side, I'm gonna put this probe on here and then we'll test this one. Okay, so yep, so this, leg of that regulator is connected through to ground. So there's the positive side. So we can confirm, you know, this is positive, this is negative. So what about this switch? Let's try this side of the switch and ground. This side of the switch and positive. Nothing on that. What about this side of the switch and positive? How about this switch and ground? Okay, so this leg of the switch is connected to ground. This one doesn't seem to be hooked up to anything. I'm wondering why. Like, why would they go to the trouble of designing a board with the holes in it for a switched pot 
and even going to the expense of using a switched pot if they're not going to actually use it. Question is, can I fix this? I mean, I'd like to have that switch actually work. If this side's already connected to ground, and this side's connected to nothing, I conceivably could cut this trace here and solder a wire between the DC jack and this unused other side of the switch. I think that'd be reasonable to do. I mean, we're not talking about a crazy amount of power here anyway. Let's get the iron all uh, heated up here. And while that's warming up, we can uh, cut this trace. All right, so I'm seeing bare fiberglass in between on this trace. So let's test it with the meter here. What? Oh, wait a minute. Look at the top side. See the leg coming out of the side of the DC jack? It goes through the board, and that's this one on this trace that I'm cutting. There's another ground plane on top up here. So this is the, the negative, like the positive is this one in the back, center positive, sleeve negative. It's going through the side of the board to that trace onto the underside that I uh, so indelicately cut. Focus you, there. So this one, like this connection should be toast now. That looks pretty well cut to me, but on this side, what's with this? Because of the cap being in the way, it's kind of hard to tell where all these traces go. Why didn't they do a couple of dedicated traces going into the switch on this potentiometer over to like positive on the DC input jack? I mean, that's the most logical way to do it because then you're turning the entire unit on and off that way. It's almost as if they've got this rigged up where it literally just turns the amp chip on and off and the unit has power the rest of the time, including Bluetooth. Like, why would you want to leave the Bluetooth module turned on all the time? This doesn't make any sense to me why they would possibly engineer it this way, unless it's, again, some kind of bizarre side effect of this being a modular kind of board where you don't always get Bluetooth. Maybe they even have versions of the board where they don't bother putting the power LED on there. And so, you know, they figure, well, you know, at some stage later on in the board revision, they went, well, we want to be able to add the Bluetooth. So they just, you know, put this section in to put the module in, but they didn't, didn't think, oh, well, shoot, you know, with the switch turning on and off and only turns the chip itself on and off and not the Bluetooth module, ah, screw it, ship the thing anyway. This board layout just befuddles me. I mean, I'm sure it would make more sense if I literally desoldered everything off this board so I could see all the traces, but... Ain't nobody got time for that, so... All right, I couldn't help it. My curiosity got the better of me. I desoldered that capacitor, which incidentally, this thing looks like it's... It almost like... It's almost like it could be used. Like, it's... The casing's a little... Which is a thing. I know it's a thing. Finding, like, electronics like this, especially from China, where the parts are actually used parts that they've, like, reclaimed off of other recycled stuff. Anyway... Um, so I took the cap off there and look at this. So here's that leg going to the negative side of the DC jack. It just literally just goes to the negative side of the cap. Why do they have this trace on this side when they have the same trace on this side? They've got it on both sides. They both go to the same pin on the DC jack. The only thing I can think of as to why they would do that would be for like current handling capacity maybe, but it's not like this thing is pulling down hundreds of watts or anything. 
I don't know. So I've got half a mind to cut this trace too and see if that finally fully isolates it so I can just do that that bodge wire trick on the back here. I I suspect that even though this pin is likely connected to something on this chip, it'd be fine for me to also reuse that pin for global power because it's just going to be switching everything on and off at the same time, right? I mean, it'll be switching the regulator on and off, the blue, the uh, which probably also is going to do this Bluetooth board. Um, if I'm turning the regulator on and off at the same time, I mean, ultimately, I just want it all to turn off when the switch is off. So, I don't know, YOLO, let's just do it. Let's just cut this trace and uh, see what we end up with. All right, and so like magic, that trace has been cut. Let's get in there and confirm. No continuity. None at all now. Finally. So let's solder the cap back in and then do that bodge wire and see where we get. All right, so I went ahead and just got all that work done because it's boring watching me solder. Um, I did use flux for those who like to give me shit about not using flux. So I've got the bodge wire on here. I've got that trace cut. I put the cap back in place. I managed to get some flux all over, so I've got to clean that up because that stuff is sticky and annoying. But anyway, okay, fingers crossed. We've got the switch in the off position. This will either work wonderfully or this thing will blow up in my face. Will we let the smoke out? And I don't want to leave this on for very long because remember, I don't have the heat sink there. But it turns on. Turn it off. No red LED. I think we have a winner. Let's uh, clean this thing up and button it up and test it out and make sure it works for good. Oh, and before I forget, I need to deal with the whole thermal situation on this chip. I don't like the idea of just throwing that heat sink back on there um, with whatever minimal bit of whatever that is on the chip. I don't know. I'm not even convinced there is anything on that chip. Uh, so I went digging through the parts drawers and I found an old tube of Arctic Silver 5. Um, this is probably way nicer of thermal paste than this little amp deserves, but eh, it's what I got. It's what I got. So, uh, you know what they say, the bigger the gob, the better the job. No, I'm just kidding. Oh, damn. Yeah, that's too much. Okay. Uh, well, we'll clean that up. <laughs> uh, that all kind of came out in a hurry. Okay, so I got that cleaned up. And let's just all take a moment here to bask in my stupidity on multiple counts. One, probably approaching this whole project the wrong way. I'm sure there's thousands of you out there yelling me about, oh, that bodge wire never worked. It'll blow up all your everything and the world will start on fire and all that. But even just from like a very minor sense, like why didn't I just put the heat sink compound on the heat sink itself? <sighs> so let's just try to get a small amount, like right there, like that. I mean, that's more than what this thing came with, and that's plenty. And before more of this goes all over, I'm putting the cap back on. You go over there. I'm trying to line this up. This heat sink isn't even centered with the chip. I'm looking at like where the holes in that pad line up, so you can see it there. Like, if I flip it around, and I put that thermal paste dead center, see how it's off? The chip isn't even centered with the holes for the heat sink. It's slightly off center. What? All right, here we go. One final test. I don't have any spare speakers at the moment, unfortunately. It's not smoking or nothing. That's a good sign. We're not starting on fire. And then turn the switch and... Ta-da! We have power. It's asking me to pair the phone to the Bluetooth. So I think we have a win on this one. That's absolutely bizarre that they designed this the way they did. I mean, I'm sure there's a reason. There's got to be a reason. And it could be as simple as, like, they just kept iterating on this design and realized that they painted themselves in a corner and said, screw it, and they don't care. Or 
it was some weird intentional thing or maybe they wanted to implement it but part of the layout for the board just wouldn't work and dude laying the board out went to the boss and was like hey boss you know if i can have an extra like two cents worth of parts per board i can make the switch work good and boss man was like no i don't care i don't know clearly i i i'm sure in one way or another i did this wrong i'm sure that was totally the wrong way to fix this issue but it's the most obvious way that I could think of based on what I perceived the layout of this board to be doing. So hit me up down in the comments if you've got a similar one of these or if there was some just absolutely massive egregious mistake that I made, which I'm sure I made. Let me know how I could have done it better. Maybe I'll revisit this one and fix it up right. At some point in the future, will there will be kind of a, not necessarily a part two of this, but Another video in this mini series, very informal thing where we talk about the rest of this little stereo system that I'm putting in my garage and I've got some more audio engineering, hacking, soldering kind of work to do, which I think I've got in my head relatively wrapped around, but we'll see where that takes us. And then in that episode, we can really start putting this amp through its paces to make sure that it sounds decent, check out its performance, what kind of power does it make and all that. In the very least, I can only think that I made this product better by getting the switch to work correctly. And even if I didn't deal with the switch, taking this apart was probably worth it to find that there was no thermal compound on this heatsink. So who knows, like this thing could have ended up with a dramatically shortened life if I was really cranking it one day and you know, it was making bad contact and just burned out the chip or whatever. Anyway, if you like this episode, I would appreciate a thumbs up. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at thisdoesnotcomp. And as always, thanks for watching.